So the one bradycardic arrhythmia that we haven't talked about yet is sinus bradycardia. And the reason for that is sinus bradycardia is not an arrhythmia. Sinus bradycardia is a condition that almost always has a discernible cause. And so the key when you're treating sinus bradycardia is to figure out why the heart rate is slow and fix that underlying reason. Don't spend all of your time focusing on, oh my goodness, the heart rate's slow, we have to do something to speed that back up. Are there instances in which you're going to have to do something to increase the heart rate while you explore to figure out what may be the cause? Of course there are. So don't say, don't think that you don't ever have to treat it, but the underlying reason is always what we want to focus on. So we have a trick. We call these the H's and T's, and these are not the only causes for sinus bradycardia, but they are definitely things to think about. <clears throat> H's and T's, there are five of each. The first H is hypoxia. And we're going to break each of these down and talk about what to do for each in just a moment. The second H is hypovolemia. The next H is hypothermia. The next H is either high or low potassium. So this is hyper or hypokalemia. And the last H is the hydrogen ion. meaning acid-base balance. Are they extraordinarily acidotic and or alkali? I guess it would be and alkali or alkali. So then we have the T's. And the T's are tension pneumothorax. Cardiac tamponade. toxins, and then thrombus. We have two types of thrombus we'll look at. We have a coronary thrombus, which is a heart attack, and we have a pulmonary thrombus. which would be a pulmonary embolism. All right, so these are the H's and T's. And again, these are not the only potentially reversible causes of, in this case, sinus bradycardia, but they are definitely some contributors that we need to think about. So how do we fix each of these? Well, first, hypoxia. That's really easy. What can we do for hypoxia? Well, we can give the patient some oxygen. Give them some O2 and make sure that they're adequately being ventilated. What about hypovolemia? Hypovolemia. There's two types of hypovolemia, remember. There is hemorrhagic and then non-hemorrhagic hypovolemia. In the pre-hospital setting, as of current, we treat them basically the same. Sorry about the phone there. <clears throat> so we're going to give IV fluids. For the management of hypovolemia, per your state protocol, we should start with a 500 milliliter bolus, and we can give up to 2 liters of fluid. Now, make sure that we're not just giving 500 or just giving 2 liters. We want to titrate this to effect. So we want to maintain a systolic blood pressure of at least 90. We want to maintain peripheral pulses and or a MAP of at least 65. Hypothermia. This is referring to hypothermia that is environmental. This isn't hypothermia of, oh, I feel bad and I'm chilly, or they've been dead for two days and they're cold. This is environmental hypothermia. Hypothermia is defined as a core body temperature less than 95 degrees Fahrenheit. What can we do for hypothermia? Warm them up. Warm them up. Hyperhypokalemia. We will learn what to do to treat that next semester. We are not going to look at that today. So we'll just put a big N-A beside of that. The hydrogen ion. We know how the respiratory rate can affect metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis, and so we can use our ETCO2 to determine 
if there's an underlying metabolic issue in some situations. If that is the case, keep that ETCO2 between 35 and 45, and we can do a little bit to treat this. There are some other interventions we'll look at, but not this semester. We're going to have to stop and go to a new video. I'm almost at six minutes. <laughs>